days of old Would you do it again? Do it again And all the stories told All the miracles Would you do it again? Do it again And there's a time to sow You will see a baby.
that you're with us. Amen. amen. It's a good spot to say amen. amen, amen. I want to go to Acts. I'm sorry, not Acts. I want to go to Psalms chapter 20. And I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic Version. Psalms 20 verse 1, Amplified Classic Version says this. Everybody say, May the Lord. May the Lord. So this is a prayer, right? And we can take these same words and pray them over our lives. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Selah. <laughs> right? We could stop right there and go rejoicing. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you on high. Now, I want to go back for just a second here. The first part of this verse says, may the Lord. Now, obviously, this is applying to someone who is a believer. But not just a believer, someone who's a follower, someone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. You, know, you do understand that the devil believes in Jesus, right? You do understand the Bible even says that that the the Bible and all or the devil and all his little <laughs> demons. We'll just leave it at that. That's a good. No, thank you. <laughs> the devil and all his little demons believe in the Lord and they're fear they're in fear and trembling according to the Word of God, but they're not followers of Jesus Christ. So what separates us from demons and demonic activity is the fact that not only do we believe. <laughs> but we are followers of Jesus Christ and we're doing everything in our ability to become disciples Go into all the world to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father Son Holy Ghost, right? That's the that's the command. Don't go make believers Go make disciples and so in order to do that first of all you have to be a disciple <laughs> You know one of our coin one of the first first year or two of, of ministry, you know Lately we've been saying stronger together Right, and, and we are. This is a phrase that the Holy Spirit has given us to, to help us move forward into our destiny. First couple of years, it was disciples making disciples. Because yep. you can't make a disciple if you're not one. That's right. So we have a responsibility to dig into the Word of God and to do everything in our ability to not look like the world. If people can't tell the difference between you and the world, there's a problem. Amen. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is in question. <laughs> Come on. So we're talking to people who are in a passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ. They're trying every day to be more and more l like Jesus Christ and less and less like the world. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling. May that person, that Lord of your life, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. If you've had breath in your lungs as a believer more than a couple weeks, I would, I would be willing to bet you've probably have experienced some kind of adversity some kind of trouble that you cannot get through and, and really sustain yourself or get through the kind of trouble that you're going to experience as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ without his help, without the Holy Spirit's empowerment, without the power of grace working in your life. Amen. Amen. May the Lord himself answer you in the day of trouble and may the name of God, there's power in the name. May the name of God set you on high and defend you. Defend you from what? The trouble that's coming. Hello. Verse 2. May, now listen. Do you, go back to verse 1 for just a second. See that little semicolon at the end of that? That means that, the, that it's, it's a continuing the thought into the next verse, the next sentence. Right? So verse 2, we could say the same thing. May the Lord send you help from the sanctuary, from, who, from his sanctuary. May the Lord send you help and support and refresh and strengthen you from Zion. That's from his throne. Anybody out there think that they can make it in this world on their own? I hope not. But this, we have an encouraging word from these scriptures today that not only does God love us, not only is he the Lord of our life, not only is he going to send us resources and strength and refresh us, he's going to defend us, he's going to strengthen us from his throne. Verse 3, and again, you see that semicolon at the end of verse 2. So the thought's continuing, right? So we could say in, in verse 3, May the Lord remember all 
your offerings. As we're taking up tithes and offerings. You see that there, there's this relationship that we just established in the first couple verses here. And, and, and in this mode of talking about who, who our Messiah is in our lives, it starts talking about your offerings. Right. And remember, may, may the Lord, remember that semicolon was there, may the Lord remember. <clears throat> why does he need to remember your offerings? So that he can give you the harvest. May the Lord remember all of your offerings. And it even goes so far in this version to say, pause and think of that. Why does it do that? Now, to, to a giver, when you pause to this verse, is really just talking about walking in the rest of this chapter. It's really just talking about walking in the victory that the Lord is providing. But to really bring it home again, it's talking to disciples. It's talking about people who are in a passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ, who are doing everything in their ability to be more and more like Jesus and less and less like the world. And in this place, there's this shield. There's this fulfillment. There's this anointing from the throne where God remembers our offerings and remembers the life that he's established with us. <laughs> Okay, Elizabeth. She doesn't like it when people call her by her real name. Do you know what the definition of Elizabeth is? As you're hiding behind the elder over there so nobody can see you? You don't know the definition of your name? This is my son Caleb's friend, who we've got to know a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Her name is Elizabeth, which means God's oath. And I believe what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today is that even though you may not know the Lord in the fullest sense that we may be talking about this morning, God wants you, this afternoon, God wants you to know that you're, that you're here on this planet because he chose you to be. And I believe it's not coincidence that our paths crossed, but the Holy Spirit wants you to know today that he has made an oath to you that if you will draw near to him, he will draw near to you. That there, that there, is, there is this God that, uh, that wants to offer you this, this salvation that we're talking about tonight. There is a God that wants to be actively part of your life, who is literally standing at the door knocking. That if you'll answer the door, if you'll answer the call, he wants to come in and be an active part of your life. And in this place, you have not even begun to dream of the life that he has destined for you. It's a good life, and it's a life that he said he had a plan for your life according to the word of God before the foundations of the world. So God is saying to you today, he stopped this whole service to specifically talk to you. Elizabeth, I've made an oath to you, says the Lord. That if you will answer the door, I desire to come in and be part of your life. Is that okay? I hope you answer it. He's knocking. So the Lord is saying to us today, he wants to be an active part of our lives. That there is a salvation plan and that his days, all of our days are wrote in his book. <laughs> if we'll just walk in him, he has a plan. Amen. Amen. So there's this good God who wants to bring us to this triumphant salvation and victory that Jesus Christ died to give us to the place where literally we want to raise a banner and declare the goodness of our God. That's right. Amen? Amen? So we're going to receive the tithes and offerings tonight, but I want you to be encouraged today that Jesus Christ is king and that we no longer have to be bound to the penalty of hell there is a salvation that Jesus Christ died to give us and he wants to give it to you. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we will believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, that our name will be wrote in the Lamb's book of life and one day when we stand before that throne or that gate of heaven, you'll be granted entrance into this eternal life, this eternal salvation with Jesus Christ, no longer bound to the penalty of hell that we deserve. Amen.
So, Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the, for the fact that you paused this service right now, sir, so that you could speak to your people. I thank you, Master, that you desire a close relationship with us, Father. And so I thank you that as we draw near to you, that you draw near to us more than ever. Help us, Father, to walk in the fullness of your plan, to walk in the fullness of our destiny. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place tonight and always have your way in our lives all god's people said amen Amen. now i would encourage you to whatever you're believing for as you put the ground that seed in the ground of god's kingdom say father thank you for this father thank you for this if it's healing that you're looking for so into that healing if it's financial prosperity you're looking for so into that prosperity
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For So I've been doing a lot of studying lately on making disciples. And Pastor Bill touched on this earlier. You know, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach that these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, so many people say that's just for the leadership. That's just for, you know, the elders and the pastors in the church. But it's not. That is a call to every single person who is here in this building. Pastor Bill cannot reach everybody by himself. Every single person here has a circle of influence. Even if you're a four-year-old little boy, you have a circle of influence around you. And your circle of influence and your circle of influence and, Melissa, your circle of influence, you can reach. Pastor Bill can't come to every single one of your friends, Melissa, and minister to them. It's just not possible. So the Holy Spirit is saying today, we need to get really serious about making disciples and not letting Pastor Bill, oh, Pastor Bill will take care of it. I'm not qualified. You can make up any excuse if you allow your mind to go there. But God called you to make disciples. You obviously have to be a disciple first so that make sure that you're good with that. But then go out and I... I just want to encourage you to look at people differently through the eyes of Jesus. Look at your family members. Look at people in the grocery store. Even somebody on Facebook who you're friends with, do what you can to help make disciples. You know, time is, is getting closer and closer. We can look around the world and we can see it. We don't want to go with regret. Don't put it all on these two. It's not. It's on every single one of us, and we all have to answer. I would go so far to say it's not even my job. I mean, that's my job as a Christian, but not my job as a pastor. To go make disciples and bring people into the church is your job. My job is to equip the saints. That means people that you've already led to Jesus. I'm helping you, I'm helping you equip them. Equipping you for the work of ministry is what Ephesians 4 says. I can't get Tori Lynn off my mind. Does somebody have a word for her? I'm sitting here pausing. I'm trying to get this download from the Holy Ghost. But I don't know, Tori Lynn. You're on, my, you're on my mind right now. I don't know if it's just a sweatshirt you're wearing and the light's hitting you just right or what. But <laughs> Father, I thank you for this girl. I thank you, Father, for the honor and the privilege of even knowing her name, let alone to be her friend, her pastor, Lord. 
I'm asking you, sir, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you would minister to her right now, right where she's at. I thank you, Father, that she is a handmaiden of the Lord by you, Father, that you've, you've called her and predestined her and established her in this time and this season for a reason, Father. And I thank you that even at a young age that she begins to hear your voice in a very profound and God-directing way. Speak to her in her dreams, Father. Speak to her during the daytime. But I thank you for your angels literally encamped around about her. I thank you that she walks in supernatural health from heaven. <laughs> that every financial need is met in her life all the days of her life. Jesus, I thank you that she experiences the fullness of your salvation in all things. And that she knows every aspect of you knows your voice, and follows your footsteps. Thank you for the call of God upon her life and the protection that you provide. I give you thanks for it, Lord. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. All right, give someone a high five, some love. Say, man, we're glad to see you. <laughs> Kids are dismissed. I guess that's my cue. In the words of Wilson Wilson on Tool Time, howdy ho, good neighbors. <laughs> uh, well, uh, tonight, I'm going to do something I've never done before. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about contending for the faith. And specifically, I'm going into the book of Jude which I have never heard anybody preach from, other than there's one verse that says, and you, holy brethren, building yourself up in your most holy faith, right, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, there's a lot more in there than what you might suspect. And actually, that verse is in a response to something that um, Jude was talking about. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> I thank you for your mercy and your grace for my brothers and sisters as they help me walk through what I believe you've been showing me. And I believe with them that they'll receive nuggets of gold out of this something that will stay with them and remain planted in their heart for years and years to come. And so I just believe you for that, and I say in Jesus' name, amen. And everybody said amen. Okay, so <clears throat> the book of Jude, you know, I used to avoid that book. I really did. And then um, you know, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me saying, you know, why are you just skipping through Jude? Well, it's because in, in my mind, I was thinking, this guy's got a chip on his shoulder. Man, he's calling out sin. He's 
talking about you know all kinds of ungodliness and ungodly men and what they do well he's not really talking about christians at least in context He's talking about those who don't even know Jesus. So, um, you know, in, in our walk with the Lord, unle unless we have Jesus, we don't have anything. You can like Bill and Monica all you want, and you can say they're cool people, and they are. And you can come to their church and be friends with them, and they'll be friendly to you. You can get to know um, Valerie and Wes and Tim and Leela and all the rest of us and Chandler and you know you'll say oh that's a cool group of people but really it does you no good unless you know the Jesus they know because without Jesus we don't have anything all we have is a form of religion a social club um, an organization I mean, without Jesus, there, there is nothing to hang our hats on. But, everybody said, but, but with Jesus, we have confidence and assurance that our Lord loves us, that he can, he'll help us, he's merciful and a good God. So, what I'm going to do tonight is lay down exactly the first part of what Jude talks about. And he, he talks, um, he talks it in a way that, that really I needed to understand. Okay? So who is Jude? Well, first of all, who is Jude? Well, Jude, verse 1 says, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to them that are sanctified or set apart and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So who's he talking to? He's talking to us. Okay? But first of all, we have to know who Jude is. Jude is the, and I'm sorry, I just didn't know this. Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus the Messiah. Uh, if you're not aware of it, after Jesus was born, Mary had other children. Yes, yes, it's true. And so, um, while she was a virgin at the time Jesus, you know, was born, she'd never been with a man. We're all adults here, right, pretty much. So, she had never had sex with a man, yet... Being a virgin, she conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is her firstborn. However, there were brothers and sisters. James, Judas, and Jude is the half-brother Judas. Now the translators shortened it down to Jude because they didn't want to confuse Judas with Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, right? So they shortened it down and they said, this is, this is Jude. They translated it as Jude. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Matthew 13 and 55. And this, I'll prove it to you, right? Matthew 13 and 55 says, is this not the carpenter's son? People are talking about Jesus, right? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, ding, 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 Joseph, Simon, and see that? Judas? Judas is Jude. Jude is who is speaking to us in the book of Jude. So to me that carries a lot of weight because number one, as Jesus' half-brother, he watched Jesus grow after, you know, when, after Judas, Jude was born. If anybody would have known that there was something wrong with Jesus, it would have been James and Jude. I don't know. I mean, just looking from my own home, you know, if, if my kids, if they had... 
if there was anything going on with one of the other ones, you know, Dad, Dad, <laughs> you know, Mom, Samantha's doing it. I said, well, you know, so, but Jude had the privilege of growing up in the household of Jesus and watching him, and at the appropriate time became a believer. which I think is really, really cool. Am I the only one who thinks that? I think it's cool. Because, I mean, if anybody could have picked apart the life of Jesus, it would have been one of his half-brothers, right? So that's who's talking to us. Now, um, Jude is also the brother of James, another half-brother of Jesus. And James was a prominent leader in the early church. So. What this does is it gives us some, cre some uh, credentials, if you will, of who's talking to us, right? And so, um, who's he talking to? Well, according to Jude 1, he's talking to them that are sanctified by God the Father. In other words, sanctified means set apart. Set apart for a purpose. For instance, uh, um, Chandler, if I said, I'm, I'm going to, you know, you, you want to help in our, in our church. And if you came to Bill and you said, hey, Bill, I want to do something, and Bill gives you an assignment, he would set you apart to do that, whatever, you know, he, he asked you. It's probably short-term and temporary, but he set you apart for that. In other words, we, all of us, have been sanctified or set apart by the Master to do something. And set apart to be something. If you want to find out what you're supposed to be, read the book of Ephesians. Ephesians tells us who we are in Him. Okay? So it's talking to us who are sanctified. It's talking to us who are preserved in Jesus Christ. In other words, you know what a preservative is? Preservative is something that will, will not decay, basically. You know, they put preservatives in food to keep it from spoiling. Well, we are preserved, right? We are the salt of the earth. We are preserved and are supposed to be a, a preserving presence in this world, right? Keep it from decaying. That's where we're supposed to be. Okay, so we're preserved. And then the last thing is we're called. Called to be and do whatever he calls us to do. That's what I got out of that first verse, Valerie. <laughs> Once I got by that, I'm going, you know, that's kind of interesting. I want to hear what this guy has to say. So um, verse 2 in Jude says, Mercy unto you and peace. And love be what? Multiplied. Well, I'm not a math whiz, but I do a lot of math in my job. But I know that addition is just addition. You know, when you add to something, you add, right? But multiplication is you take a number and times a number, and you get a bigger number, right? 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8, but if you multiply 4 times 4, it's 16, right? And it, it just keeps getting bigger as you go. So pa the Apostle Paul said, usually he'll say, um, grace and peace. I like to say grace and peace. I picked it up from a pastor that I had, and I love that, grace and peace. But here, James is talking about it being multiplied. In other words, he wants it to be bigger and bigger in your lives, which I think is really cool. So he doesn't want us just to have peace, but he wants us to have multiples of them in abundance. So what is this letter is about? Um, something was going on in the churches that Jude had to talk about. Verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, of the common salvation, say common salvation, it was needful, say needful, for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for this faith which was once delivered 
unto the saints. Now, this verse is pretty much where we're going to hang out for quite a while because there's a lot in there. First off, let's talk about common salvation. Common salvation is not cheap. You know, we think of common as, you know, if I pulled some change out of my pocket and said, you know, look at that. And you say, yeah, there's nothing special about that. That's just change. Well, I guess right now there is something special about it. But normally, you know, <laughs> normally uh, it's, not, it's no big deal. You know, I got 35 cents. Well, big deal. I got 35 cents too somewhere. I can probably dig through my couch and find 35 cents somewhere. But this common that he's talking about is not cheap. It is what's known as a universal. It's a universal salvation to everyone who is saved. In other words, it's, uh, it's a common salvation, but it's, it's not common in the sense of its worth. It's common in the sense that, Bill, if you're a Christian, and you are, there are certain things that is common to you and common to me as Christians. Because we're believers, there are certain doctrines and foundations that are common. But it's, it's a mutual salvation, yeah. And so, um, the, the pitfall of Christianity, if there is a pitfall, but it is a pitfall, in that some people just come into the church. And they come in without the basic fundamental doctrinal understanding of just what a Christian is, who they are, why are they Christians, a lot of times they don't understand what Jesus did for us. And quite frankly, we are all, you can be the most, there's a lot of people in this room that are sharper than me, but I'm telling you, nobody understands fully and completely about what Jesus did for us. It is so awesome and off the charts. It is amazing. So, <clears throat> Jude wanted to talk about the common salvation. But according to this verse, he said it was needful or necessary for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered, say once delivered, once delivered, once delivered I'll explain that in a minute, unto the saints. To the saints, not the ain'ts, Right? It was delivered once and for all to us. So, um, the scripture, New Testament talks about the faith. There was, in the, after uh, Jesus had rose from the dead, and the believers were in Jerusalem, primarily, said so there was a large number of priests that were obedient to the faith. Well, there you go. There's the faith. Um, and so, basically, the faith are the essential truths of the gospel that all Christians hold in common. There's that word common again, or common salvation, right? Um, so, Some of the things that we all, as Christians, hold in common and are really not negotiable. These are rock-solid, firm facts. We sung it tonight. Matter of fact, thank you, Bill, for singing that. I appreciate that. Okay? Because it went perfectly with what, and I asked him to do it. Okay? So, and he loved me enough to do it for me. But I believe in the... Yes, da -da, da 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 I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the holy church and, and, you know, all the things that he said in that song. So there are some essentials like 
Jesus' birth. It was a virgin birth. Mary did not have sex with a man. It was an immaculate conception. And really, when you get into what the scriptures say, Jesus, the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Son of God, the only Son of God, the only Son that's existed forever, he poured himself out into flesh. I can prove that by the Psalms because son, you know, one of the Psalms says uh, Jesus rejoiced and he said, a body you has prepared for me. He poured him. He didn't pour part of himself. He wasn't just a natural man that's going do, 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 do. Oh, hey, I think I'm going to be a Messiah. No, none of that. Jesus was, in fact, the only begotten Son of the Father. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Trinity, three in one. Can I explain it? I can try to explain it to you, but I've got to be honest with you. In my natural mind, I don't get it. I get that I am a spirit. I get that I have a soul, and I get that I live in a body. So in that sense, I can grasp that I am a three-part being. But I have never been forever. I have never been outside of time. I have never always existed. So one of the essential elements that every Christian needs to settle in their heart is that Jesus was born of a virgin. Because he was born of a virgin, he had the perfect, sinless, spotless blood throwing, flowing in his veins. Because he was born of a virgin, he could pay for our sins. He, didn't, he was sinless, right? So the virgin birth is one big part of it. And I could go on and on about that. And, you know, around Christmas time, I like to go on about it because it is, it is an awesome thing what Jesus did when he took upon flesh and became a man so that he could pay for our sins. He lived a holy, blameless, spotless, sinless life. He died as payment for my sins. Say, my sins. And he was buried in fulfillment of prophecy. He had to be buried three days and three nights. There was no half days, no partial days, no fancy Jewish accounting of days. It was literally three 24-hour periods. Which, I'm not going to make a big deal of this, but you and I have talked about this. You know, Good Friday... Sure, it was a Good Friday, but it probably was most likely, it, well, it couldn't have been the day that Jesus was crucified. Any way you cut it, from Friday to Sunday morning is not three days. More likely, it was a Good Wednesday or a Good Thursday. So, I just shook the basket big time. I know I did, but there are people that will that'll bring that up. Especially atheists, they say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. You know, you count, you do the count from Friday night to Sunday morning. It is not three days and three nights. And I have to agree with them, it's not. Only tradition has said that Jesus died on a Friday afternoon. Of course, it talks about a Sabbath. They think it's the regular Sabbath, but there were high holy Sabbaths, such as Passover. Okay? So... I hope I didn't mess too many people up with that. I really do. But, I mean, if you want to know more about it, you can see me afterwards. I'll get you the materials. Okay? So, he died, and he rose from the dead and triumphing over death. Because he lives, because he was resurrected, so shall we. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead... We are miserable because there is no hope for us. But because he rose from the dead, we can have confidence and joy in that. 
it, it really, I mean, Jesus, he's number one. Yeah. He is God. He is literally God in flesh, resurrected man, sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. He's attentive to our prayers. He is it. He is it. King of kings, Lord of lords, God the Father has made him that. So, so uh, we talked about the common salvation and um, the exhortation to contend for the faith. Listen, we don't make up our own faith doctrines. I'm sorry, you just can't do it. If you want to make up your own doctrines and call yourself Christian, don't try because it's not going to work. You might as well go off and um, form the church back in the 60s. There was a comedian called Flip Wilson. He had the church of what's happening today. And he would do shimmying, shaking, and he would do everything, but none of it was Christian-based. It was Actually, it was kind of a spoof at, at Christianity is what it was. But, uh, um, you know, the, the earth religions, they make up their own stuff, right? The Baha'i faith, they say there's many ways to get to heaven. As a matter of fact, they construct uh, places of their worship and they have many doors, meaning you don't have to come through one door. You can go through any way you want to do. That is totally false. We cannot make up our own religion. Sadly, a lot of Christians, because of their ignorance, be I say ignorance, because they haven't been taught or they refuse to be disciples, learning disciples who can make other disciples, they come up with these things like, well, you know, I, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to tithe. I, I, I don't have to, you know, if I want to shack up with somebody, I can just go ahead and shack up. Because God loves me, right? Well, he does love you. However, he does not approve of us shacking up with someone who we're, you know, we're not married with. So we cannot say, I'm a Christian, yet I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That is lawlessness. And that is not being a disciple. It's not the Spirit of God. So, um, you know, we just we can't make up our own religion. There are essential foundational truths. And actually, the early church had a very, very good um, creed. But uh, talking about the faith, you know, the faith. It's all through the, well, a lot of places in the New Testament. It talks about the faith. Um, Jeff, if we can go to Acts 2.42. And it says, and they continued steadfastly. Talking about the early church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. But please note, it's talking about the apostles' doctrine. They're talking about these men who had walked with Jesus, been with him in ministry for three, three and a half years. They had doctrine that Jesus gave them. You know, doctrine is basically, it's a foundational teaching is what that is. Don't get scared off by the word doctrine. Romans six seventeen says, "But God be thanked that through you, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of what doctrine to which you were delivered." That's interesting that it would say to which you were delivered. I would have said it, which was delivered to you by the apostles. But that's not what that's saying. It says, to which you were delivered. And it carries the idea of a mold. We were delivered into the doctrine so that 
that doctrine could be a mold to shape us and com conforming and complying to the likeness and form of the doctrine in the teachings of Jesus and the apostles and the prophets. So here we see it's not just, um, well, actually, you don't see it. You see it in my next verse. <laughs> I'm going to drop, uh, well, Galatians 1.23 says, But they were hearing only, talking about Paul, that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches what? The faith which he once tried to destroy. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of what? The apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the New Testament gospels, gospels and the epistles and any bit of prophecy that's contained in there, I'm thinking Revelation, has a lot of prophecy which has not been fulfilled yet. It is a prophetic thing that has been spoken and it will be fulfilled, literally. Jesus, in Luke 24, he's, he gave us some prophecies of things yet to come. Part have happened, part will happen. So we see that the faith is a doctrine laid out by Jesus, the apostle, and the prophets. That also includes teachings in the, in the Old Testament as well. But um, that is the foundation that, that we as Christians have or should have. And so it's important, uh, very important. What you believe is so important. Your eternal salvation is based on that. Don't tell me I can believe anything I want to believe. That is not true. Okay? There are some things laid out clearly in the scriptures that we must believe. And, so, and once we find out what those are, then we, then we just we believe. But actually, if you, what you are supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to be doing, is digging out these truths to ourselves. Because all through the epistles and um, the New Testament, there are, there is so, there's an inexhaustible teachings that we need to apply. Do I walk in all of those? No, I don't. Partly because I don't know. Partly because, God forbid, you know, I've been holding back and said, I just don't want to do that. Right? But... I'm having a real change of heart here lately. <laughs> what do you want me to do, Bill? You want me to stand up here and tell these people that I got it all together? <laughs> Hello, look at this. I obviously don't have it all together. And neither do you. Right? <laughs> so we, <laughs> so we, we know in part, we prophesy in part, we know the doctrine that is, you know, that's essential. Basically, you know Jesus, you love Jesus, you are born, do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you believe that he paid for your sins? You are born again, you are saved. There are other teachings in the New Testament which are equally true, but not contingent upon salvation. For instance, um, my Baptist brothers and I, we don't see eye to eye on the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, right? I have good scriptures that tells me that that's a valid experience for today and it didn't pass away. They believe just the opposite. Do I say of my Baptist brothers and sisters, you're not saved because you don't believe in speaking in tongues? Hello? No. Do they say about me, because I speak in tongues, that I'm filled with the devil and I don't have the Holy 
that I don't have Jesus and I'm not saved? Hello? No. That's silliness. I believe in prosperity. I do. I've been poor and I've been uh, better than poor. Right? I'm telling you, better than poor is better. Because I can't what did I just say? Better and poor is better? Oh, I hope my mother-in-law is not watching. She's an English teacher. So, um, hi. <laughs> Oh, I just lost that. Hallelujah. Technical difficulty. <laughs> okay, I think I got it. So, my point is, there are essentials to salvation, and there, there, are, there are other doctrines in the scriptures that just because I may not believe in it or I've been taught wrongly does not mean I'm not saved. Okay, yeah. let's get into, uh, Jeff, you don't have it, but there is, a, there is an Apostles' Creed, which I would like to read for you. The Apostles' Creed was one of the first creeds that the early church, everybody say early church, early. the ones that really knew what it meant to follow Jesus and the ones who paid a price for following Jesus, they This was their official creed. It's like the Reader's Digest version of what we believe in faith, okay? So it says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. Some versions of that say hell, but it's, it's the place of where, where, the, where the dead was placed, okay, and it was a temporary place. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Hang on, I'll explain that to you. And the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. This is the doctrine that the very beginning, those early believers, they would confess this. Now, I don't know exactly what year this was written, but it was formalized, obviously. But this was considered common essentials of faith by the church. Okay? The communion of saints does not mean taking communion. It rather means fellowship. It means contributing, sharing, and communion. They are all the same thing. Fellowship is performing services to help others inwardly and outwardly. This is a required part of a Christian's life according to the early church. In other words, you don't want to go to church? Well, that was not accepted by the early church. You don't want to share. You don't want to help one another. You don't want to pray for one another. You don't want to love one another. They didn't buy that. Only in America today do we buy that. And I say we, I mean some, right? I don't want to say all. I, I don't want to believe that. But I think it's more of a case of misunderstanding, not understanding, right? Bill, you know, it, well, I'm not going to pick on you. He's family, so I know him. Uh, Bob, you know, if you and I didn't regularly come together to worship, I wouldn't know anything about what's going on in your life. 
I wouldn't be able to pray for you. You wouldn't be able to pray for me. Right? We could get online and we could say, hey, you know, pray for me because this is happening or that is happening, but I guarantee you, it's not the same as eyeball to eyeball. It's not the same as let's pray. Let's believe God for this. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's called the, the communion of the saints. That's what they meant. They didn't mean take communion with the, with the, with the juice and, and the bread, although that's, that's part, that's a, that is a sacrament of the church that we need to partake of. That communion of saints was exactly what I just said. It was fellowship in God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In the church assembly is unity with God and those who believe in God. Christian fellowship is based on the unity of the Trinity. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. I'm going to read out of the New American Standard, but I'm thinking the King James is close. It says, God is faithful through whom you were called into what? Fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Fellowship means we're not only fellowshipping with each other, we're fellowshipping with God. The communion of the saints is carried out through the meaningful assembly of the saints. This is the church assembly where we have unity with God, should have unity with God, and where we teach God's word in truth and look out for the needs and the interests of each other. You're famous for that because a lot of times you'll come over, you'll see, you know, I, may, I might be thinking about whatever, but he'll come over to me and he'll grab me and he'll say, hey, are you doing okay? And I go, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just gas, leave me alone. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, he sees something, you know, he doesn't know what's going on with me. I defy anybody to do that online. Tell me how that can happen. It can. And I don't want to get off too far on this, Bill, because this is something I harp on. Now, I know that right now some of the assembly is hindered by the COVID thing that's out there. People are scared. I get it. If you can't come to church in faith, then join us online. It's good. We're cool. But eventually we're going to come to a point where you will rejoin the assembly. Why? Because it's God's purpose. It's God's plan. It's not rocket science. He's made this really, really easy. So, you know, to any, <laughs> I'm getting myself in trouble. To anybody that's out there who cannot assemble with us right now, God bless you. His peace and his mercy is with you. We love you. We're pulling for you, and we will keep in communication with you as best we can, right? But you have to realize, after we get by this COVID thing, and we're on to the next crisis that's manufactured, after we get by it, you will need to assemble. Amen? And I'm not saying... I, I misspoke on that, the, that it's manufactured. The hype of it is manufactured. The virus is real. There are people who have died. God forbid. We hate that. I, I hate it. I despise it. Um, we love the brothers and sisters of Cornerstone Community Church. Make no mistake about it. You can call us anytime. We'll help. We'll do what we can. This man has the heart of a pastor. He'll go. He'll help. He'll do whatever we can do. And sometimes he'll call me. We'll pray people at night. Just happened recently. And, um, you know, you can submit prayer requests through our online app, and I guarantee you, Brenda and I get them. 
You get them, don't you? Matt gets them and others. I don't know how many others get them. But we pray, and we're not patty caking around when we pray. We're believing God. We're stopping what we're doing when we get those things, and we pray. We just don't say, yeah, God bless you. We'll pray for you. No, we actually do, and we get the ear of our master. Okay? So fellowshipping is part of the communion. Okay, fellowship is between believers and the truth of God. The church does not come together to discuss atheism, right? And why there is no God. <laughs> Mark Lowry, he has a song, you know. Um, I am an AT, I am an ATH, I am a whatever it is, atheist, you know. You know. Um, we do not discuss atheism other than just to give you a heads up on what an atheist is. We really shouldn't spend a lot of time on cults. Although sometimes you have to know what various cults are in the air. What do we spend the majority of our time here? We spend the majority of our time preaching on God's word, teaching God's word, because it's going to change you. It has to. It's seed. Okay? All right, so um, the purpose of communion is building each other up in the faith. The faith is built up through the teaching of God's truth in righteousness. You know, I have a lot more on the book of Jude, but I think I'm, I'm really going to wrap it up right at that point. Because we're really talking about doctrine. Jude talked about um, ungodly men who had crept into the church. Sometimes people will just come in the church. And when it says, um, well, okay. Um, uh, Jeff, if you could put up Jude verse 4. I'll show you this one thing. And then we'll just kind of leave it at that. And then I'll show you how Jude told people, or brothers and sisters, to deal with it. So Jude chapter 4 says, For certain men have crept in on notice who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. When it says certain men have crept in unnoticed, it actually carries the connotation that they came in through a side door. They didn't come in through the front door. They didn't come in to the door of faith, believing that Jesus is their Lord. Now, we can have people come in, and that's great, because, I mean, if they can't hear about Jesus here, where can they hear it, right? But these are men slash women who intentionally come in and over my upper 30s, maybe 40 years with as being a Christian, November of 1978, yeah, 40, 40 plus years, I have seen men that'll come in and they are doing, basically, they're looking for girls. They want to pick up Christian girls. I've seen Christian, or uh, girls come in looking for Christian men. I've seen it. I hate it. I don't like it, but I've seen it. They have no intention of being a Christian. They have no intention of following Jesus. They are unregenerated, and they stayed that way. They chose not to take the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. Right. Jude thought this was so important that he wrote this letter to the church. This is not an evangelical letter. It's not something that Billy Graham would say as the, they're playing just as I am, you know. Um, this was written to the church. It was a serious thing. And these men were coming in and it said, 
who turn the grace of God into lewdness. Lewdness carries with it the idea of it's sin and I don't care. I'll let everybody see. I have no embarrassment. I have no shame. That's what lewdness is. They turn the grace of God. The grace of God says God loves me. God is merciful to me, right? God's grace and power in my life is enough. They took that message and they said, because of that, I can do whatever I want. God loves me. I'm saved. You're telling me I'm not saved? Well, I'm, I'm telling, yeah. Hey, I can, I can shack up with anybody. Who, you, who do you think you are telling me I can't do that? You, I'm not supposed to get drunk. I can get drunk if I want to get drunk. Who cares? God loves me. That's turning the grace of God into lewdness. Sin without shame. I could go on and on, but let's take it a little bit more down to where we live. You're telling me I can't talk about Bill? You're telling me I can't talk about Melissa? Who do you think you are? I can talk about anyone I want to talk. You, what? God's word tells me don't be gossipers, don't be murmurers, don't be complainers. What? I'll do what I want to do. That, why? Because God loves me. Yes, he loves you and he wants you to stop doing that. That is lewdness. I don't think I need to make it any plainer, do I? I don't. I'm, I'm beginning to sound like Jude. Go oh, figure. But this was so important because it was a danger to the church. See, if we let that stuff go, what happens? Schisms, divisions, where there is, um, where there is strife, there is every evil work. That stuff goes like poison through a church. That stuff is like a COVID-19, if you will. It'll spread, it'll be a cancer, and it will destroy the body. See? He's especially anointed to stop that nonsense. And actually, so am I, sort of. I'm kind of dealing with it now. But uh, we cannot allow that. And um, we should look for individuals. Just, just be aware. No, don't look for them. Just be aware that... Um, There, there are people who will teach that, you know, and Jude goes on, he says, there's spots in your love feast. Translation, potluck. And we get together and we have fun and we play games and we bring stuff to eat. And, you know, it's a really good time in the Lord. But these guys and women, they'll come in and they'll just eat with us. The Spirit of God, or Jude, the Spirit of God speaking through Jude, says there's spots. And he says a lot more about them, too. But... So, realizing that this can happen, what should be our response? And Jeff, I'm going to skip it right up, right to uh, verse 20 of Jude. <clears throat> Jude gives us a couple things to do. Are we, when, when we know that there's people saying these things, um, how do we deal with it? Jude says in verse 20, but you, beloved, first off, he tells us to look inwardly. He didn't say, well, stand up and fight against those guys, those bunch of black neck buzzards, you know, la da 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 I'm going to enter into a conflict. He didn't say to do that. First thing he says is you, say, me, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Building ourselves up can mean increasing in the knowledge of and acting on what we know. It means building on the foundation of faith delivered to the saints. That foundation is sound teaching. Sound teaching disagrees with what these people are saying. So first off, we get our own head screwed on straight. This is what, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it. The Bible says, everybody say, the Bible says. In order to say that, you have to read it and know it. It's not going to come by osmosis. 
Bill's not going to lay your hands, his hands on you, and you're going to go, ah, yes, I know everything now. That's not going to happen. You have to study to show yourselves approved, okay? So building ourselves up means that we study and we get into the scriptures and also praying in the Holy Ghost. That means praying Holy Ghost prayers, you know, meaningful prayers in English, and it also means praying in tongues, your heavenly prayer language. It means I'm praying in tongues because I honestly do not know what to pray for. Therefore, I, I allow the Holy Spirit inside of me to boil up and speak words that I don't understand, but God understands perfectly. And he actually, according to Romans I think it's the 8th chapter. He um, helps us with our infirmities, with groanings that we don't know how to utter. Okay? So, first thing to do is we deal with ourselves. Okay? Building ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And next we deal with those who are influenced by the ungodly doctrines. It didn't say deal with the teachers. Well, actually, for a leader, you have a responsibility, and so do I, actually. If somebody, and if somebody, somebody's teaching something like, you know, the most wild, far out thing, you know, um, we don't, and, and they, we point it out, and they still want to teach that, then the leadership is anointed to take care of that, right? But <clears throat> in the, inevitably, people in our fellowship will be affected by that. And so what we do is we deal with it in one of two ways. Verse 22 says, On some have compassion, making a difference, making a distinction. There are some people... They don't need a stern word. They're just believing what somebody else told them. And they, they just need to be told what the truth is. Right? We don't grab them and say, what's wrong with you? You know, don't you believe? Well, you know, hang on. The Holy, if we pray in the Holy Spirit, handling our inward man first, we won't make that mistake. Okay? So the first way is deal, and the Holy Spirit will tell us, how to handle, uh, you know, bad doctrine. He, he will. It will either be a compassion. And then the next verse says, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. In other words, sometimes you just have to get stern. You know, sometimes people just don't understand. Or they get obstinate. You know, well, the, this, this person here told me it's okay for me to, to be lewd. You know, who do you think you are telling me? Well, I think I'm the pastor. I think I'm a ministry gift. I think I'm a brother and sister in Christ, and I'm concerned for you. And you need to straighten up and fly right. Right? You tell them what the Word of God says. And a lot of times they'll just say, oh, okay. Some people just need that strong, strong hand. Others are very tender, and we do not want to bruise them or hurt them in any way, making it worse. Okay? Whether it's compassion or whether it's a strong hand, either way, we need to correct any false doctrine that is a danger to those in our church. And that's the crux of it. You know, if we love our brothers and sisters, and we do, I'm telling you, this church has shown me, uh, you know, Brenda and I, more love than you guys can imagine. You think we come here to minister to you guys, but it's, <laughs> it's you guys that are hugging on us, smiling at us. Sometimes I come in here, you know, life, listen, 
Life beats me up just like it beats you up sometimes. Sometimes I come in those doors just like, my God, somebody smile at me. You know? Somebody tell me, Chuck, you're going to make it. You'll be okay, you know, and if they know what's going on, you know. So it, it's, you know, the... To cover up sin is dangerous. It's dangerous for the body because eventually people will backslide. If they're allowed to get away with lewd sin, you know, or they're allowed to think that that's okay, then other things will slide. Eventually they'll come to the point where, oh, Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. I saw that on a Discovery Channel. Or Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. I saw that on a History Channel. And I'm wondering about what they're teaching at that church, you know, because, and why? Because eventually, eventually what we believe and the, any, any error that's in our life or sin or sin is in our life, it'll, it will bear fruit. And we can't allow that. And, um. So that's why sometimes your leaders are stern with you. That's why sometimes uh, Bill won't let you get away with some things. That's why Matt will say, hey, you can't do that. Or Valerie or Lilo, they'll say, what are you doing? What's going on here? It's because they love you. It's not because they think they're hot stuff and they're strutting their stuff, okay? And that's my signal. I'm done. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, you know, uh, before I do that, can you hear my heart tonight? I, ho I hope you do. I hope you do, because uh, we, we absolutely love you, God. We're believing for the best. You know, kids, we, I say kids, you're young adults, we're believing for the best for you. We really are. Yeah, I know Brenda and I, uh, we pray nightly for this church and church body. Sometimes as the Lord brings remembrance to us, we pray for individuals. Um, but this is a safe house. It really is. I can't say that of, of uh, every, every church that, that's around, but this house is safe. They have your best interest in, at heart. They really do. So that's what I wanted to convey to you. And um, find out what the doctrines are, the essential doctrines. Find out what makes you a Christian. The, what do you believe and know why you believe it. It will make all the difference for you. I promise you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, Master, I did the best I knew how to do. This, this is a tough book, but Lord, it's a book of love. Thank you, Master, for uh, helping my brothers and sisters make, their, make the creed of who Jesus is and what he did, make it come alive, sir in their hearts and in their lives. Make it so real to them that they will just totally have a new falling in love with, with you all over again, sir. I'm asking you to preserve them, to keep them, to guard them. Hedge them in, Lord God. Help them to make the right decisions. Give them provisions. Help them to find their place in the body of Christ. And Lord God, those who have giftings and ministries that have not yet been birthed, not yet evident, I'm asking you to make it alive and make it bloom and grow. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love you.